When I was a grad student in materials science and engineering at the University of Utah, a professor asked which was worse for the environment, paper or plastic. He said that the environmental impact of these bags was about the same because of the resources that goes into making each of them, but the plastic bags were slightly better for the environment because they required less energy and they were faster to make. However, this only considers two factors, the materials needed to make the bags as well as the use life, but it does not consider the end-of-life impact. So my graduate, stu my, my graduate work was in absorbent materials, and when I graduated, a new opportunity landed in my lab. A non-government organization in Guatemala reached out to the university and asked if somebody could develop uh, a new material. And because of my research, the university reached out to me and asked if I would be interested. So they needed a superabsorbent biodegradable material for menstrual hygiene products. So the problem is that developing countries want access to disposable products like those available in the United States, but the waste management infrastructure is very different and in Guatemala, the garbage is thrown down the hills onto the homes of the less affluent. So we didn't want to solve this problem by creating a new biohazardous disposal problem. So my students and I began working on this project, and we kept running into three pretty significant obstacles. So the first was anything that we made needed to be easy to process. Second, it needed to be biodegradable. And third, whatever we made could not rely too heavily on the use of petroleum products. Then one night during dinner, my four-year-old daughter spilled some rice on the floor, and my wife asked if I could clean it up before bed. So I said, no, I'll wait until the morning when it's not so sticky and it'll be easier to clean up. So my wife doesn't like me telling this story, and she uh, definitely doesn't agree with my approach. Be that known. But um, the next morning, I went out to the kitchen. I swept up the now dry rice, and it cleaned up. It didn't stick, up to, it didn't stick to the broom or anything. So um, as I was driving to work that morning, I was thinking about rice, what happens when it cooks and dehydrates. I was imagining how, uh, how dehydrated rice is shriveled and brittle. Then I started thinking about minute rice and how it looks and feels different from regular rice. So then I was started to imagine what the pore structure of rice would look like, and then I had an epiphany. So I stopped at the grocery store, and I bought some minute rice. And when I got to campus, I asked a student to run some tests to see what the absorbency capacity of rice was. And it turns out rice is very absorbent. So this began my first venture into the use of biomaterials as replacements for single-use plastics. So when I looked around, at, at single-use plastics that are used in consumer products, I suddenly realized that they're all really bad for the environment. So before I get into that, I'm in this talk, I'm not going to be talking about recycling and other worthwhile practices that we can all adopt as consumers. Instead, I'm going to be focusing on some scientific approaches for making plastics more environmentally friendly. So now for the big question. If these plastics are so bad for the environment, then why are manufacturers using plastic materials that end up in landfills, the ocean, and all over the planet? It's because they're cheap, they're easy, and they're fast to make. So the problems with plastics are multifaceted. First, the chemicals used to make plastics are resistant to degradation, and they've been further stabilized with the use of additives that, in, that pose health hazards in themselves. Second, um, over 90% of the plastic waste out there comes from consumer products. And third, to top it all off, the use and disposal of plastic materials uh, through abrasion, washing, light, and heat causes the formation of microplastics. What are microplastics? There are plastic particles that measure 5 millimeters or less in diameter. According to the Ocean Conservancy, humans consume a quantity of microplastics each week it is equi equivalent to the size of a credit card. So how do our bodies respond? Our bodies recognize the, the chemicals used to make plastic materials as biochemical signals, which confuses our bodies because then they look like hormones. So the, the smaller the microplastics, the more likely they are to infiltrate our cells. Um, so we have discovered that exposure to microplastics contributes to a myriad of diseases, including diabetes, infertility, toxicity, 
cell damage, cell death, and many others. Um, and uh, we know that microplastics are bad for us, bad for the environment, and it can be found in every single one of us, whether we use plastics or not. If you think you can avoid the microplastics problem, it's actually impossible. They're found all over the planet in soil, water, and the very air we breathe, and they've been found from the depths of the Marianas Trench to the isolated heights of the French Pyrenees Mountains. So zooming this back out, we know that there are health and environmental hazards that come from single-use plastics. When we talk about the life cycle of materials, we need to consider where the materials came from, how they're used, and what happens when we're finished with them. If we're going to consider the whole life of plastic materials, the end of life can look like many things. We can throw them away, recycle them, do something new with them, or we can consider biodegradation. So biodegradation means that plastic materials, means that the materials are broken down and consumed by bacteria, fungi, and other microorganisms. Wouldn't it be great if we could use a plastic product, throw it away, knowing that it biodegrades and it's completely gone and doesn't cause any problems in the future? So when people use the word biodegradable, they think the problem is solved. It's okay if it just degrades in the environment, right? However, when we talk about the degradation of plastics, we need to consider both biodegradation and disintegration. All plastic materials disintegrate through physical and chemical processes like UV exposure, um, uh, heat, abrasion, and just other environmental conditions, and that's what creates microplastics. So we need to disintegrate plastic materials to make them small enough to be consumed by microorganisms. So if we're going to be making microplastics anyway, then maybe we should consider making them biodegradable so that once they are uh, disintegrated, they're gone, and we're not creating more microplastics problems. So at some point in history, the idea of plastics opened up so many possibilities. And I'm not suggesting that we get rid of plastics altogether. They're incredibly useful. Can you imagine not having access to plastics and using a catheter made of copper so um, I believe that plastics have their use, but they've been over-engineered and overused. So let's talk about some solutions. For example, if I take a sandwich to work and put it into a sandwich bag, how long does the sandwich bag need to last? Not hundreds of years, a few hours would be great. Over-engineering is where we take something and make it exceed the use it was intended for. So what if we change this? What if we just engineer plastic materials to serve their purposes? If I get a package delivered to my house, it doesn't need to last much longer than it took to get the package to my house. If I use a plastic toothbrush, it doesn't need to last more than a few months. So this is what I, what I, what I propose, that we design failure into these materials. How about thoughtful failure, where we design the end of life that's most meaningful for that item? So perhaps some materials can be uh, recycled, others upcycled, and others turned into nutrients for microorganisms. In my research, we're, uh, we're building a failure mechanism into plastic materials, so they'll work as they always do, but after they've been thrown away, they've been exposed to water for some amount of time, the failure mechanism kicks in and initiates the degradation process. So back to plastics. To make these easy-to-make materials, manufacturers use high-throughput, melt-forming processes, which means they can make a thousand grocery bags or menstrual pads or sandwich bags in a minute. So viable, biodegradable um, so alternatives need to be as cheap, as convenient, and as useful as current plastics, or they will never be adopted. Um, let's see, so some have suggested the use of bioplastics or biopolymers, but many of them have very different processing methods. Um, so if you can think about um, uh, it's like white school glue, as an example, is a water-based material. And so a lot of these bioplastics are water-based materials, so they just require time to dry. And so instead of relying on the rapid co uh, cooling of these melt-forming processes, they need this time to be able to dry in order to cure, so that would require extra time and space. So, um, so I think it's unrealistic uh, to, to, ask man yeah, to ask manufacturers to overhaul their manufacturing processes because it would cost billions of dollars in new manufacturing equipment, and it would require space to make bioplastics at the same volume as current plastics, and nobody has that amount of goodwill. 
So therefore, we need viable solutions to plug into current man uh, sorry, viable uh, solutions to this complex problem. We need to make alternative materials to plug into current manufacturing. And we need to prevent the accumulation of plastics in the environment by considering the end of life, no matter what it is, and design for that. So there are and will be in the future many different approaches to solving this big problem. There's a little known company in Italy that is made of biodegradable garbage bags that is used with yard waste. So we've tested the biodegradability of their material and it works. We need more, more companies to think innovatively like this. Um, next, uh, their innovators have developed a corn-based polymer, oops, PLA, I think you're gonna, okay. PLA that works well in mass manufacturing. However, it's only biodegradable after it's been exposed to high temperatures of 140 degrees Fahrenheit for up to seven days, and that's just to initiate the degradation process. And finally, um, people are working on taking plastic materials and using thermal processes to break them down into molecules that can be used to make new materials and products. This is an example of upcycling. Industry solutions to the plastics problem are not great. When they talk about adopting sustainable practices, they keep defaulting to recycling, where they are committed to purchasing recycled materials to use as their feedstock. But this is problematic because it relies on two things that are completely out of their control. First, people and how they throw things away. And second, it assumes that all communities have adopted effective recycling uh, practices but in reality, in many locations, the infrastructure just isn't there, and much of what we throw away, or what, I'm sorry, much of what we recycle ends up in the, in the landfill anyway. So we know, that, um, sorry, we know that recycling isn't the only answer. It's one of many answers to the big plastics problem. We have talked about some methods for, um, for preventing plastic waste out there. So other approaches need to address how to get rid of what's out there. So um, as you probably already know, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is three times the size of France, and it, along with the other plastic islands in the ocean, are still growing. According to the United Nations Environment Program, there are 400 million tons of plastic waste disposed of each year across the planet, which is equivalent to 100 million African elephants lined up trunk to tail, and they would wrap around the planet 15.2 times and that's what we dispose of as a planet every single year. So we have to keep living our lives, and that means that we're going to use plastic. But let's do what we can to make a difference. So solutions can come from grassroots efforts, governments, and academia. But the most powerful and impactful solutions will come from industry-led efforts. They have the money, so they should lead the research effort. Instead, they're relying on academics and others to solve this problem first. As consumers, we could put pressure on industry to make a change. A few years ago, there was a, um, there was a press release for one of my startup companies, and um, within a couple of days, one of the, a rep from one of the largest pad, menstrual pad manufacturers called me on the phone and was upset because people were asking for biodegradable pads. And he was upset at us because we had changed the conversation. So let's rethink the materials that we use, how they're used, how they're recycled, and what we consider the full life cycle of plastic mm -hmm. materials. And let's refuse to accept that there, is, that there isn't an answer out there or many answers to solve this complex problem. So to bring this back full circle, there are many different plastic materials used in, in, pad, in hygiene pads. And, but we're making progress. I have a project where we're, we're working on uh, biodegradable plastic adhesive that's used in menstrual hygiene products. Um, funda fundamentally, we're trying to address the stability of plastic materials to make them more digestible for microorganisms. We're using materials that degrade in six months, and we're only considering options that plug into current manufacturing because we want consumer product companies to adopt our technology. We've been testing the manufacturability of our material with an adhesives manufacturer, and it checks all of the boxes needed for, uh, for manufacturing. So wouldn't it be great if a consumer product company came across a biodegradable alternative to any of the materials that they had that didn't require them to change anything at all in their process? 
So we know the problems with plastics. We need better methods for preventing and getting rid of all the plastic waste out there. Our health is connected to our planet's health. So back to the story of the rice. The night I decided to let the rice dry so that it would be easier to clean up, I didn't realize it would take me down this pathway of looking for biodegradable replacements for plastic materials. I mean rice, in my kitchen. So let's keep our eyes open. Other solutions are out there, and they might be just as simple. So let's go find them. Thank you.